is going to go off. And um, so Angela's going to, we've talked about this, she's going to present and talk about the party for a little bit. And we know a little something. Uh, and, then, um, and then the kids would love the chance to ask you questions. And I'm going to moderate that piece. And so again, I want to say thank you. Out of all the terrible things that have happened in the pandemic, one wonderful thing is that we found the time that you were able to come share some of your day with us, which is amazing to think that a vice presidential candidate of a major American political party would come speak to this small school in South Carolina is wonderful and we are so grateful. And so this is a very high moment and our school year has just begun. So we wanna thank you for that. And we look forward to hearing your personal story and this, you know, your journey to, with the Greens. And you know, you're know you in the history books now. You're, you know, people will always know that you were the vice presidential candidate in 2020 for the Green Party and it's just wonderful. So please share and, and, and thanks for being here. Well, first off, everybody, and, and Mr. Kreutzner, thank you for having me. I mean, this is it's a big deal for me, too. And I think part of the reason that it's so important is because I live here in South Carolina. I live in Florence. So, and I am not a native to the area. I am originally from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And I think South Carolina is absolutely beautiful. It is absolutely magical. I am happy to be here. And... Um, very interested in finding out what young people are thinking about as far as the future of their state and the future of their country. So those things, I'm very, I'm, I'm, I'm honored to be here. Um, like I said, my name is Angela Walker. I am the Green Party presidential nom a vice presidential nominee 2020. I um, originally am from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I have five grandchildren. I have one child. Um, I, uh, I drive a, a dump truck, which is why I'm hot, sweaty, and flushed. Um, I was actually working in another town today. So um, those roads, when you're riding on 95, you're riding on I-20, you're riding on a lot of the, the roads that used to be dirt roads and now they're paved, that's what I do. So I, I drive a truck every day. Um, I love it. I feel like a big shot. When I'm in my truck, I've been a, a driver for almost 20 years. It'll be 20 years uh, next year that I've been a commercial driver. I absolutely love it. Um, politics comes, is, is one of those things. Every time I've, I've run for office, this is the last time this is going to happen. This is number three. I am never doing this again. But every time I've run, I've been drafted. Um, originally, I ran for Milwaukee County Sheriff in Milwaukee, uh, you know, my hometown uh, in 2014 as an independent socialist. Um, and I'm sure y'all have questions about what that means. So we'll, we'll definitely get into that. And I'm not going to take 30 minutes to tell y'all about myself. I want to hear your questions. Um, that was my initial run. We got 20% of the vote in that election, which surprised everybody, myself included. And in 2016, my friend in Medio, Mimi was his, his nickname, Soltisic, uh, ran for, uh, he ran for president with the vice, uh, he ran for president with the Socialist Party of the USA. And I was his running mate then. And uh, what you were saying, Mr. Kreitner, I actually did kind of make history um, because I am the first person to be nominated for vice president twice in the history of the, the Socialist Party of the USA. Um, so I thought that was kind of cool. And I swore it all off, moved down here in 20, late 2016, done with politics. I mean, I've, I've done organizing. I was the legislative director for the transit union where I'm from. I have fought on behalf of public education. Um, making sure that, you know, we had a whole student bill of rights and all kinds of things that we, we were working on. So, you know, there's a lot of things that are very close to my heart. Came down here, intended to live quietly, and here I am. So, happy to be here, ready for your questions, interested in what y'all want to know and, and, and having that dialogue. Angela, you clearly don't mess around. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we were watching uh, you and uh, your running mates, uh, 
last night your thoughts thing that gets streamed and put on YouTube. And so that socialist thing, that just happened yesterday, didn't it? It sounded like from, from listening to that. Uh, is that what happened? Oh, no. That I've been a socialist again? most of my life. No, I'm talking about the, 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 uh, as far as the, the Socialist Party's uh, candidates for president. Was that recent? It, it made it sound like that was recent. In 2016, I ran with them. And then we, okay. are, we have their nomination this year as well. Okay, cool. All Even right. though you, they don't have ballot lines and things like that. So it's not like, it's more like an endorsement. It's not sure. like a dual party thing because they're not, they don't have the accreditation in that way that we do. So yeah. but this red green alliance is something we talked about. And in, 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 in fact, it's when I met Howie Hawkins, who's running for, you know, the president. Uh, he's the presidential nominee for the Green Party. And the original Green New Dealer, when you're talking about the Green New Deal, that was him. He drafted this thing. He's been in since day one. So, um, but we were on a panel together in 2014. And after that, there was talk about building a red-green alliance between the socialists and the greens because we, we ideologically, we, there's a lot of places we have intersections and it just made sense and so to be able to have that happen in 2020 is a really big deal for a whole lot of folks on the left we're very excited about that no thank you for that explanation so uh students this is your chance you're gonna do your you know uh hand raise with uh through zoom and then i'm gonna moder moder i might call you out of order um just so you know uh, so start pressing that button, but our first question is going to go to Amelia and she's going to unmute herself and put on her video and, and there. Ah, so many buttons. Sorry. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, so my question is like out of the four pillars of the Green Party, uh, grassroots democracy, nonviolence, um, dang it, ecological wisdom, and I'm trying to like do my best to memorize them, but um, anyways, out of all of them, which is like the one that is most important to you? I would have to say the most important to me personally, ecological wisdom, because this planet is absolutely fabulous. She is, the earth is amazing and gives us everything that we need to heal, everything that we need to thrive. And all we have to do is take care of her. And we are not doing a very good job of taking care of her. And so being that, you know, all life as we understand it originates on this planet. For me, it just makes sense that if we care about the quality of human life and also non-human life, animal rights are a big thing for me, a very big thing for me. I, I love animals to the point that I don't eat them. So, and I'm not bashing anyone who doesn't. So let's, let's be very clear about that, you know, but it is my personal choice to be vegetarian and um, for ethical reasons and also for health reasons. But I want polar bears and, you know, tigers and, and I want whales for my grandchildren. I want those, those animals to have, you know, their habitats, to have their life. And the way that we are moving as far as climate change, that's not going to happen. And that is, I can't put words to how unacceptable and how unfair that is. So ecological wisdom of the four pillars for me personally is the one that means the most. That was a really good question. Thank you. Thanks Amelia for that. Um, and thanks for the answer. All right, Jack Woodward, you are up, sir. Hey, um, so a while back, um, Donald Trump pulled out of the Paris climate accords and for like you got a lot of backlash from that and so I guess I was wanting going to ask what were the Greens party view on the Paris climate accords and his removal anything that involves the U.S. being a part of a global agreement 
to do what we can and do our part because let's let's face it the united states our carbon footprint is pretty big i mean it just is and we have to own that and any agreement that works cooperative cooperatively with the rest of the countries in the in the world to try to reduce that is something we support and to have someone who is in the position that uh, Mr. Trump is in basically say that these are things that don't matter. We should not be a part of it. When our carbon footprint is as big as it is, is not something that we find acceptable. So we, we want, and it is in our party platform, it is also in our campaign platform, it is our intention to reverse climate, to work on reversing climate change and not by 2050 because I don't think we've got that long. I mean, if we're going to do something, we are going to need to do that now. And it, it needs to start right now. So that was a good question. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. Um, okay, Meredith, it's your turn. Hi. Um, my question is, why did you choose the Green Party all, over all the other parties? And that goes, that's a really good question. That goes back, y'all are asking great questions. Um, that goes back to what I was, what we were talking about a little bit earlier about the Red Green Alliance we were talking about in 2014 um, when I was running with the Socialist Party. And I know the Green Party's platform. I am very supportive, as I was, I was saying earlier with Amelia, being, being ecologically conscious and making sure that we are advocating for the planet and doing what we can to mitigate the harm that we have done to this planet. Those things are very important to me. And also, as a socialist, if I don't believe in, well, fighting the exploitation of human beings under capitalist, under a capitalist system, it just stands to reason that I'm also going to fight for the end of the exploitation of the planet and of its non-human, her non-human life. Um, so those things are a natural synergy for me. The Green Party you know, believes there's a whole, you know, there's a whole peace platform that they have. I want, you know, being somebody, I grew up in the 80s. I was a kid in the 80s. And I remember watching movies about the countdown to nuclear war. Do you know how much that scared us? I mean, to know that this was possible, that, that someone could press a button and everything you, you knew would not exist anymore. And also, you know, knowing about Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And, and the damage, generations of damage that these weapons have caused. Um, we're the only party that is actually talking about nuclear de-escalation and disarmament. Those things are important. I don't want this, this same threat that's hanging, been hanging over my head for all 46 years of my life, basically, to be hanging over my grandchildren's head too. I, I, I don't think that it's fair. Um, I don't think it's acceptable and, and one of the biggest things about the Green Party is that they're, they've always been out front for peace and the end of, of nuclear armament, um, nuclear escalation, and those things really matter to me. So I, you know, it wasn't a jump to come from the Socialist Party and, you know, work with the Greens. I'm, I'm, I'm where I belong. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Meredith. All right, Will Britton, what do you got for uh, Angela? My question is, what is eco-socialism? Why do you believe in it? And yeah, I actually just kind of answered that, but eco-socialism is, and actually I didn't because it wasn't specifically that question. So eco-socialism is linking the rights of the planet and her non-human life to end the exploitation of those resources under capitalism and also 
you know, making sure that everybody is okay and growing, you know, that anything that we do as far as making advances for human beings, you know, also is done within ecological limits and with being mindful of what's good for the planet rather than just we want these things and it's just this mindless growth and we're just going to take all this space and we're going to use all these resources and we're not going to be conscious of how we're using them or where we're getting the, getting them from or what the impact of our use is. And so within ecological limits, you have, you know, the growth of communities and, and things that people need, but also being mindful of what is good for the planet herself. Did that Thank you. help at all? Yes. Thank okay. You. Thank you. So that's Thank how it well. <laughs> <laughs> We're all doing great. Um, all right. Um, Suzette, you're up. Suzette. All right, Suzette, I'm gonna, I'm gonna roll over to Audrey and when you're ready, we'll come back to you. Audrey, can you, um, you have your question for Angela now? Yes. Um, hi, thank you for coming today. Um, I just wanted to know, um, with the rising amount of LGBTQ and especially trans hate crimes in America right now, what do you plan to do to limit that amount? That is an excellent question. One of the first things is to imp implement the Equality Act and make sure that folks are protected, you know, all of the folks across the LGBTQIA rainbow, one of whom is myself, and a whole lot of other folks that I know, um, making sure that in public spaces, public places, in employment, in, uh, you know, public accommodations, that people are safe, that, that you know, when a hate crime is committed against someone across the, you know, someone who is on the LGBTQIA spectrum, and we all know that crimes against trans people, particularly trans women of color, are epidemic. And putting some teeth into prosecuting those as hate crimes. And also going further with, you know, not we need to change the way that people speak about particularly trans and gender non-binary, gender non-conforming and non-binary folks. We're not the butt of folk, you know, they're not the butt of people's jokes. Um, they're not here to be made fun of. They're not here to be, you know, that's not, that's not what, we are an intolerant culture is what I'm trying to say. And I think that there are things that we can also do as far as public discussions to make sure that we are recognizing our own inherent biases and that we are treating people with dignity and respect no matter where on the spectrum they fall, whether, you know, whoever people are. And so I think one of the biggest things is passing the Equality Act, which is currently stalled and has been for a while, and also um, putting putting some more force into federal hate, federal hate crime legislation so that it covers uh, and is very specific about covering crimes against people on the LGBTQIA spectrum. Excellent question. Thank you. Thanks, Audrey. Um, so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Charlie, and then I'm going to come back to you, Suzette, because it looks like you're ready now. So Charlie, then Suzette, please. Um, I just want to say thank you for coming. And my mom actually has a question. Hi. Hi. <laughs> thank you for being here and, and talking with the kids. This is such a great honor. I uh, just wanted to get your opinion on the fact that, we, you know, we've never had a more diverse slate of presidential and vice presidential candidates. We have two black women, three women running um, right now in our country nationally. There's never been a greater focus on social equity, racial equity. Um, but yet we're also a very divided country when it comes to those issues. Um, what do you, where do you see us going from here? 
I think I've been calling this the year of impossible things. Um, we, if you had told people five years ago that 2020 would see a plague, <laughs> um, you know, lube, a rebellion and looming economic crisis all at the same time. And, and we're not even going to talk about an overactive hurricane season. And the fact that the Arctic was a hundred degrees a few months ago. Um, all of these things at the same time, no one would have believed five years ago that 2020 is exactly what it is. This is a unprecedented year. And I think, you know, for all of the anxiety that it has brought us, I think it's also bringing opportunity. I think we are at a place in our history in this country where more people are questioning the way that this, the, the, this country works, the way that it, it's set up, that it benefits some folks and doesn't benefit others, and why it's like that, and how do we heal? And I think that one of the most important things that we are going to have to do is be uncomfortable and uh, be willing to sit with our discomfort enough to get real about the history of this country. That, pe that genocide has been committed here, that racism and misogyny are baked into this system. And a lot of people are not gonna wanna hear that. It's going to challenge everything a whole lot of folks have ever been taught about what the United States is. But I believe that if we are willing to be honest, then we can start visioning a country that does not operate the way that this one is operated. And not only that, if we challenge this idea that we have about American exceptionalism, I think that it will set us up to move as better world citizens around the world. And instead of acting like the world's bully, the way that we have been, um, I think we'll be in a place where we can work cooper cooperatively with other nations and exchanging ideas and resources and things like that and not coming from this place of domination and aggression that we have been. So I think that this is a year that a lot of things are being brought to the surface that are making a whole lot of folks uncomfortable, but I also think that that discomfort is necessary. And like I said, I've got five grandbabies. I want them to have a just world to grow up in. And for your babies too. So that's is something that matters to me. Thank you for running and thank you for speaking your truth. It's so great. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate y'all. I'm honored. Thank you. Thanks, Gibsons. All right, uh, Suzette, you're up. Here we go. Okay. So my question is, being a political figure, how do you make sure you don't say things that may be used against you and your party by those with opposing viewpoints? Excellent question. I always assume, and this is something I, I do anyway, I think before I speak. <laughs> and I don't, I don't say things, if I'm not sure about something, I'm going to tell you I'm not sure about it. Or if I haven't read up on something, I'm not going to, you know, floss and, and, and make up an answer. I'm going to tell you I'm not sure about it. Um, I'd rather you think, gee, she's unprepared than, gee, she's a liar. Um, and when speaking, especially like, you know, engagements where I'm being interviewed and things like that, I always speak whether I'm being recorded or not as if I am being recorded because I expect people to record what I say. I expect um, the internet is, as they say, the internet is forever. So, you know, you can delete a post, but that doesn't mean it's gone. So it's just, I think just making sure that I take the time to consider my words before I say them. And also, if I'm not sure about something, to be honest about that. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, Angela, I have to thank you too uh, for that unpaid endorsement of our technology policy at the school, which includes the quote, the internet's forever. It <laughs> so, is. Thank you for, we're all, it's, it's hard uh, trying to help them navigate this safely. So that was just an aside, but I appreciate you, you mentioning that in terms no, of- No, it's a, it's a very big deal. I mean, young people might not get it, but you'd be surprised. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Suzette. Okay. Uh, pa, you're up now. Hi, thanks for coming. Uh, I wanted to know, what is your view on the 2019 and 2020 uh, Hong Kong protests and the numerous reports of police brutality and human rights violations, um, especially with the passage of the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act? I'm going to give you my most diplomatic, but also most stripped down answer. I am a Black American. <laughs> I, and being that I am a Black American with the history that my folks have in this country, I think that I personally would not and could not criticize protesters in other countries. Um, I believe that folks have the right to protest. I believe that, you know, and, and being that I'm from the United States with the things that we have here in our own backyard that need to be cleaned up, we're not in a moral position to criticize any other country, the way that they handle, you know, what they handle. We're, we're not in that, that place. And so, you know, I, I support protesters the world around. Um, I want folks, I want governments to respect the rights of their people. I want my government to respect the rights of its people first. And so um, I am uncritical about, until we clean ours up, I can't speak on anybody else's. <laughs> I hope that helped. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Pi. Um, hey, Fran, you're up. Love to hear your question. Um, can I turn my camera on? Uh, hi, sorry if I'm stuttery. I... <laughs> you're fine. Um, I wanted to know how you felt about the criticisms about the Socialist Party because I heard people talking about socialism it's talking about how it creates like abnet, absent price signals, reduced incentives, low feasibility. And I just want to know your thoughts about that and if you can prove them wrong. When I talk about socialism to people, because a lot of the time, I mean, theory is necessary. You have to have theory as a grounding. But when I speak to people about socialism, I talk about the ways that it impacts their lives right now. So you think about the fact that I'm a member of a credit union, a socialist. If you're a member of co-ops or you, you have a co-op, you work for a co-op, those are socialist things. You know, free libraries, free hospitals, free school, public schools, those things are socialist. And usually when you say that to people, they're like, oh, then it's not so scary. I think that the criticisms of the Socialist Party and socialism itself, this is a country that is very entrenched in its, in its capitalism. And for capitalism to work as it is supposed to, the work as it's intended to, there needs to be people who are perennially on the bottom. And if you're socialist, what you believe is that no, there doesn't need to be a bottom. There's enough to go around for everybody. Everybody can be okay. We don't have to have a system where some people do really, really, really well and a whole lot of people do really, really, really badly. We don't, we don't have to operate that way. And so criticisms of the socialist party, we, this country has been red bait, what we call red baiting folks for, for decades. You know, oh, this is socialist. Oh, that's socialist. Socialism is bad. You should be afraid of it. 
And so when you mention it to people automatically, you know, there, there's resistance because this is, this is the culture. But when people find out exactly the ways that socialism has worked and like just thinking about how many people right now, I think across the country, the support for Medicare for all is at 84%. People are saying, you know, we pay taxes. We should be able to have to access health care because health care is a human right and not have to come out of pocket for it. It's only in the United States that this is thought of as like some great big deal. Other countries have been doing this forever. It's just what you do. That's socialist. And so, you know, I think it's just understanding that people's resistance to socialism in this country, it's intentional, it's, it's engineered. The culture has taught folks that socialism is a bad thing. And if you are not, you know, you don't have someone bring you a different viewpoint about how socialism works or how it helps people in real ways, not like this theoretical way, how is it actually doing that? And how is it doing it now? Then, you know, the fear persists, but we're not scary. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Nice, Fran. Uh, okay, Liam, your turn. Hi, and thank you for being here. I was wondering how long do you think it will take for able to fairly compete with the other major parties in the U.S.? That's an upward battle right there. And thank you for recognizing the fact, you know, I think a lot of people don't understand that third parties and fourth parties, because, you know, there's, you know, as, as Charlie's mom mentioned, there is another woman running for president um, on the Libertarian Party ticket. So, there's a lot of other parties out there, but the way that the two party, the duopoly is set up is to make sure that no one else gets in. So the debates are closed to us. Um, a lot of, we've gotten, our campaign has gotten more media attention in Latin America, in Europe, and in India than it has in the United States. That's, intent, that's by design. And so I, I can't put a time on how long I think it will take for the duopoly basically to fall and for us to get ranked choice voting, which is something our party advocates for. And it's, it's Maine is going to, uh, in their elections, their presidential elections this year, Maine will be having ranked choice voting where you can, you know, rank the folks that you want. And also we support representational, uh, repre uh, proportional representation where, you know, if you have all of these parties there, you know, you have people representing the people who support those parties, which would, you know, in the duopoly, we'd, we'd need to change the system. It wouldn't be a two party system anymore. And I think more people are moving towards wanting more choice. You want a true democracy, you should be able to choose who best represents your values. You shouldn't be confined to one or the other and having to hold your nose and take Pepto-Bismol to cast your vote and hope that you get what you want. That's not fair. That's not democracy. That's not how that works. And so I don't know how long it's going to take. Um, I consider every third party that runs, every fourth party that runs, we're adding another push to that duopoly. It eventually is going to fall over. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Liam, that, that was a good question. Uh, <clears throat> Angela, today we... Um, you know, uh, had some resources for them to look at. One was uh, a Guardian article uh, that it was an interview with uh, Mr. Hawkins. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know, there's no American newspaper equivalent that's got a personal interview with him about different stuff. And so we we're talking about why that would be. And the kids were speculating, you know, England's a, you know, a big partner of ours and 
you know, and why would they care about America? And it was just really interesting. And um, we appreciate your being part of this because um, we feel and our parents and students understand we can meet, uh, you know, last week it was League of Women Voters. This week it's a Green. Next week it's a Democratic Party person. Later on it'll be a Libertarian Republican. That it's okay. And let's hear all these different ideas and make up, make up our own minds. And, yes. and, and, and for the pandemic, the kids are primed. I mean, this year people are really interested in citizenship and things that are going on in the country. So it's an exciting time to be a presidential candidate and uh, to come talk to kids in school. <laughs> so thank you. I think that, but just for what you just said, because this year is unprecedented in so many ways and we are having to change the way we do so many things and change our assumptions about how things work, I think is a perfect time to have the discussion. I mean, my aunt was like, why do we have two parties? I've never heard her say that before. She's like, why is it only two parties? This is stupid. I was like, Yes. <laughs> so it's happening. That's good. All right, Kessler, your turn. Hi, thank you so much for doing this. I actually have two questions. Sorry. <laughs> um, so my first question is like high profile third candidates like Kanye West, what do they do to like the legitimacy of third party runs and independents like Ross Perot, Ralph Nader, all of that? What does that say about the way third parties um, candidacies are looking? It all and then my second, okay, oh, you go can ahead. go first. Oh, no, okay, go and my second question is, um, do you still think there is a swing or an independent voter in the United States since the country seems to be so polarized? Do you think there are people who are constantly changing the way they look at things? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I can answer that second question. First, there are a whole lot of folks who are undecided, who are uncommitted. I mean, if you think about 2016, with everything that was happening, the biggest portion of voters were the ones, and I want to say it was 100 million people, who didn't bother to vote. And it isn't because they were apathetic. They're not apathetic. It's because they are alienated. You have to, and this has been my, my gentle advice to the Democratic Party since forever. If you want people to show up, you have to give them someone to show up for. You can't just pick the candidate you want them to have and say, this is what you're getting and then shove it down people's throats and expect them to be enthusiastic about it. It doesn't work like that. Especially when your platform is not offering what people are asking you for. You can't chastise them for not showing up when the call from the streets has been Medicare for all and, you know, decrim and, and a whole bunch of other things. If that's what you're hearing and that is what you have a critical mass around and you have the ability to include these things in your platform and you choose not to, you can't be mad when people are like, you know what, I'm good. Because that's exactly what happened. It was what, 30% of folks who could vote, were eligible to vote, chose not to. Um, and your first question, give it to me again, because I just, I'm old. No, you're totally fine. So high profile third candidacies like Kanye West, what do they do to the legitimacy of a third party wow. run or an independent run? Well, it depends on how you think about third party candidates to begin with. If you are someone who believes, and there are a whole lot of people who do, I battle them on Twitter and on IG all the time. Well, I don't battle them. I just leave it alone. But you know what I'm saying. That really feel like if you are a third party candidate, you don't have the right to exist. And they, tell, they will tell you that. They say that. Why are you running? Drop out. You have no right. Um, you have no right to do this. If you're someone who thinks like that, then nothing we do will be legitimate for you. You, we, you know, if you're coming from a place where it's only the duopoly, this is how it is. This is the way it's going to be. This is the way it's going to stay. Y'all are interlopers. You're spoilers, which we get a lot. Then nothing we do will be legitimate. 
if you are open-minded, if you are someone who believes that a true democracy is choice, is giving people the option, set out all the, the possible candidates in front of the people and let the people choose. And let it let it be, you know, let the chips fall where they may. Let folks make their choice. Then I don't think legitimacy is so much a question for you. And if it's, you know, my personal thoughts on folks who run, because I, I am aware of Mr. West's run, and I'm also aware of, you know, Vermin Supreme um, with the, you know, with the libertarians. Uh, there are some people who are not necessarily in it to win it. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Um, I think because we have a history of not taking third parties seriously in this country, that um, we all get painted with that same brush. But the the most important thing, I think, with all of that is the fact that it is an absolute uphill battle for us to even run. To even, I mean, right now, the fight for bat just to get on the ballot. We're on the ballot right now in, I want to say, 32 states. My home state of Wisconsin is, we're taking them to court. We're also taking Pennsylvania to court for, and for trying to push us off the ballot. They're trying to push us off the ballot in Texas, too. And these are not Republicans that are doing this. These are Democrats. And, you know, in Wisconsin, it's simply because I moved four miles from my last place of residence. That's it. We have more than enough qualified signatures. They're contesting it on the strength of some of the petitions are in that have my old address, which was my old address up until June 1st. And then after June 1st, my address changed, which we worked with them on something as flimsy as that. And so when I tell y'all that it is an uphill battle simply to get on the ballot, not even talking about media access or, you know, getting on the debate stage, it's, it's daunting. Um, and, you know, it, it, it gets frustrating. But as far as like legitimacy, let people let people run, let them run, let them be presented to you and you make your own choices to who you support. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, thanks Kessler. Jack Wheeler, what do you have for Angela? Hey, thanks so much for being here. Uh, my question is, so America is more of a capitalist country than not, obviously. Uh, and there are some very staunch anti-socialist people, as well as people who are just unsure about it. Do you think the whole face of socialism is sending the right message uh, to voters, trying to entice them to, you know, vote in support of socialism? My question to you would be, what is the right message? And I'm not being facetious. I really want to, because for me, right is, when I hear that, uh, for me, that's relative. What I think is correct may not be what you think is. And so- I I'm asking to... more for your opinion, I, I guess. Mm -hmm. No, I'm just trying to think like, as far as messaging, let me see if I'm hearing you right. What you're asking is like for people who are committed capitalists or people who are not necessarily well versed in like what it means to be socialist, how would we present our platform to them in a way that would want that would make them interested in supporting us? Is that what you're asking me? Yes, or just like, I, I um, or if they're, in your opinion, sending that message correctly, or, yeah. Well, I think the, the one incorrect way to send that message would be, if you're not voting this certain way, then you're, you know, insulting people. 
That's the wrong way to do that. One thing I never do with people is like, if you don't vote for us, you're stupid. Never, never, ever, ever, ever. My grandmother is 80 years old. She's not going to vote for me. She loves the platform, supports it with her whole heart. But she is 80 years old. She, the duopoly is what she knows. I will not argue with my grandmother. I, I understand. And so one of the things that I have, you know, in discussions with folks is I'm not going to berate you for not agreeing with everything we say. I'm not going to do that. That's, that's not cute. Not a good look. Um, I think that what helps with people who are unsure or who are ambivalent, who have been red baited their whole lives, um, who you know, want to know a little bit more is just presenting them with the issues, presenting them with the platform itself. Is this something that you can support? Is this something, is Medicare for all something you support? Is housing for all something that you support? Is update, is is, uh, revamping the way that we do public public transportation in this country? I I personally want high-speed rail. I want, you know, things that run efficiently and and cleanly. Those things make me excited. And so when I'm talking to people about our platform, rather than trying to, you know, go into the nuts and bolts of socialism, I just give them issues. What do you need? And does what we're offering, can we meet it? And usually that that keeps you know keeps the dialogue happening i think the only way the only incorrect way to give this message is to try to beat people in the head with it and be aggressive to them like you better you need this no you don't do that i think that's that's unhelpful did that answer your question because i know i went around the world with it uh yeah kind of thank you (laughs) okay Jack's clearly a tough customer today. It's uh, fine. That's a good question. It's it was a great question. Ask what you want to ask. Um, Evie O'Shea, what do you got? My question was, um, there are some people that like um, have not heard of the Green Party or they don't know much about it. Like, how can you make your message heard by more and more people like how can you raise your profile further that's a question we just had last night we do a live stream every tuesday night um ask howie and angela where we do pretty much what i'm doing right now only it's howie and i doing it and howie is like a human encyclopedia so i mean you ask him questions it's pretty awesome um Raising our profile, I think we're doing everything that we can to get into, you know, print media. Um, We've gotten on a lot of podcasts, you know, they're not necessarily like huge podcasts. Some of them are bigger. You know, Howie does the stuff. He's been on C-SPAN and things like that. Um, Because I work during the day, you won't see me on interviews like that because I'm driving a truck. Um, But just social media. Um, we're all over social media. We're all over YouTube. We're all over IG and Twitter, particularly. I do my own Twittering. So, you know, if you say something to me, you're getting me. Um, and just getting the word out, like, and what I asked folks last night on our live stream to do, because we had the same question, is we need people who, if you are a a support of the Green Party, if you like the platform, if you like the party platform, the campaign platform, tell people about it. Tell people about it. Tell people who we are. Um, You know, if there's something that impresses you, bring it up in a conversation with folks. Have them look it up. Have them do their own research on us. You know, not just as candidates, but also as a campaign and also as a party. There's a lot there that I think that that people really respond well to. 
and you know it opens the doors for some really good conversations so i think one of the most important things to help us get our profile up is for folks to just if you like us tell people about us tell people you know tune in on tuesdays ask questions um you can you know find us on social media and ask questions things like that we do this stuff all the time so we we don't have the media access that the the big two do and so we are more reliant on word of mouth and 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 you know folks talking to folks that they know that's really important i think it's better that way anyway thank you for answering my question thank you thanks evie uh and uh linking back to amelia's first question of the day uh, that's grassroots democracy you know talking to the people directly uh without a filter or someone telling you what it means uh so amelia good work for getting us started today uh angel do you have time for one more question to bring yes. us time today so will yes. Courtney, uh you're gonna be up and then we're gonna um we're gonna say goodbye and 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 do everything and, and it's just been nice all right well i'm i'm very glad my question is being asked now. I'm, I'm, I'm glad I got in the queue just for the last one. Anyways, uh, I read some, an emphasis on some of the Green Party's 8,000 word essay on police reform. Uh, I found a lot of interesting and in, uh, interesting uh, in progressive proposals, uh, specifically the paper makes a revival, a case for the revival of the Black Panthers and community control, uh, which could potentially stop, you know, racist programs such as Stop and Frisk, uh, from Mayor Bloomberg, but my main question is now that police reform is just such a controversial topic in America. Um, if elected, what's your plan as VP to uh, systematically integrate community control um, into today's extremely divided America? That's an excellent question. And, you know, with the eyes of the world, I would argue, on my home state yet again, um, Kenosha is in Wisconsin. I, uh, I think it's a very timely question. And I think one of the first things that we would need to address is ending qualified immunity where, where police officers who commit these crimes are able to hide behind their union. And, and understand me, we are union people. So, but as far as the way that police, police unions have operated a little bit different and that I'm being nice. Um, and ending qualified immunity, making sure that officers who commit crimes against people actually pay penalties for those crimes instead of walking. I mean, I, I, I can't tell you how many folks that I have been in protests for. I, I, I can't even count it at this point. Um, how many names, I've, we're tired of adding names to these lists. So I think that prosecuting officers who commit these crimes and, and sending the message that, you know, this is not something you can just do with impunity. But as you mentioned, you know, in your question, we have to change the system because if the system which was formulated, you know, if you think about the roots of policing in this country, it was to make, you know, to track down enslaved people who, who ran away. So, you know, criminalizing people for being black, for being brown, for being indigenous, we have to be honest that that is baked into the system in this country. And if we want to not move forward in the way that we've been doing for the last, I don't know how long, we're gonna have to change that system. And key to respecting communities is that piece of community control and self-determination, which is the call from the streets to defund the police. That's exactly what that is. What it is saying is, 5% of what police officers in this country respond to is actually violent crime. We should not be calling police officers to mental health interventions. We should not be calling police officers to situations that we need social workers for. Um, so when people are saying defund the police, it's reallocate money from 
really big police budgets and the in most metropolitan areas in this country the police budget is the lion's share of their city budget i know in milwaukee that is definitely the case and to you know not necessarily like have absolutely no police at this point but to have police officers who are not operating from a place of unquestioned inherent bias to where you know they're bringing these beliefs into these communities and they're acting them out on people so re going through and and re working how we do police is definitely at the top of that but you know also reallocating money from police budgets to provide wraparound services for communities so that you have people who are trained to come for mental health interventions or uh, substance use interventions. Another piece of that is also decriminalizing and legalizing marijuana and also decriminalizing other drugs in the way that uh, Portugal did, where if someone is having an issue with substance use, and they're acting out or you know there's other things happening they don't go to jail because this is not a criminal issue it is a health issue and so they get a ticket to appear in court or a ticket to see a counselor and and the effort is made to find out what what's going on underneath what's happening with you rather than throwing someone in jail because they got high we're not handling that that well so all of these things go into our platform on community control of policing. It's not just snatching money out of police budgets. There's like a whole thing, uh, a whole program for that. But when we're talking about community control, we're recognizing the fact that um, the folks who are policing primarily black, brown and indigenous communities are people who are coming from a place where they don't know these communities have no respect for these communities and do not see the people in these communities as people. And therefore you can basically do whatever you want to them. And we've had enough of it. Thank you. I, I really appreciate your insight on this. I appreciate yours. Thank you very much. Uh, Will and uh, Angel, that's a very heavy end uh, and weighty end to um, the conversation, but it's probably actually good because we're not tying everything up nicely and neatly. But it's a reminder, the school has given you resources uh, to the Green Party's website. You know, Angela said that if you want to learn more or if you want to figure something out or understand a policy better, they're there and available. Like she, uh, Angela saying, you can uh, you know, directly communicate with her uh, and, and she'll answer. And, and you should be doing that with every party. And there might be issues that are important to you. And you can, you know, bounce them off the, the different parties that we're going to be encountering over the next couple of months. Um, and this is all, all anyone asks is for you to, to listen for yourself, what everyone has to say. And um, Angela and everyone, this was a special day. We met uh, Angela after work. We met after the school day. It has been wonderful. Um, uh, Angela, thank you for everything. Good luck for the next couple of months. And I, I want to invite you to something. So you just moved here recently, right? I have actually lived in South Carolina for the last, I got in here, I got here December of 16. I mean, I'm okay. not new, new, but yeah, yeah, living here, it's been almost three years. So we're a school that goes on field trips all the time, every week. And so we're figuring out how to do that during COVID, but mm. Bishopville yet? Yes, I know Bishopville very well. I was so that's actually where I was working out of today. Have you been to Pearl Friars place? I haven't. Okay. I'm gonna email you later on today or tomorrow. It's a nice outdoor topiary garden. It's a top, yes. A perfect I pass field it all trip. the time. I just haven't been in there. Yeah, so we will. Um, hopefully, we can uh, coordinate and, and meet you there sometime after the campaign's over. That would be fantastic. Yeah, that would be lovely. It's it's a thirty minute, as you know, thirty minutes from your, from where you live. Um, we're all figuring things out. Uh, good luck to you. Thank you to everybody, students, uh, teachers, parents who joined us in this special afternoon thing. Uh, Angela, please, good luck uh, with everything and, and to be brave and to run for office and for sharing your time with us. We're very grateful. We're going to turn on our videos. I'm going to turn off the recording and we're going to say goodbye. And
I, I needed that. And also in the chat for anybody, if you want to email me directly, my email is in the, I put it in the chat so y'all can work with that however you want to and like reach out. And if you have things that are important to you, we actually do want to know, particularly because you are young people. We're interested in what you think is important. So please reach out. And yes, thank you for having me. This was, this was amazing. All right, well, goodbye, everyone. Say goodbye to Angela and have a good evening. Bye. Thank you so much.